Hi, everybody, and welcome to Council Room 2023, 10 Years in the TARDIS. Uh, we are doing a panel today about uh, the very much loved British comedy series, Keeping Up Appearances. And uh, we are going to introduce ourselves. First of all, I'd like to start by introducing Jeremy. Jeremy, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeremy B. Matt. Uh, I host a podcast called Doctor Who Panel to Panel. Um, my forte, I'm a big Doctor Who fan, but I kind of specialize in Doctor Who comics, anywhere from, you know, beginning of Doctor Who comic publishing up to present. Uh, and I do a podcast about that. And otherwise, as far as keynote appearances, um, I've been a big Britcom fan. I've been watching British comedies since uh, I was in high school back in the 80s. So I, I know a little bit about them. <laughs> and uh, my name is Greg Bakken, and uh, I, I I do have a, quite the passion for British television. I run a, uh, a, a, I don't know, a site, whatever you want to call, from the archive, British television, blog, vlog, podcast. Uh, basically, what I like to do is is talk a lot about British television, and uh, there are, you know, different ways that you can uh, reach out to me if you want to. Um, but we, I do a lot of videos on YouTube. So please check out my YouTube page. And I do videos on Doctor Who as well as British television. But today we're talking about keeping up appearances. And uh, that is, uh, you know, Jeremy, when I saw the list of uh, panels that were available, for me, doing uh, keeping up appearances was uh, really it kind of meant something special to me uh, because I had an aunt and uncle who were very much like Hyacinth Bouquet and Richard. <laughs> and uh, they, they, not that they were trying to hide who they were or anything or be not, you know, make themselves look bigger than that, what they were per se. But uh, my aunt was always one that uh, she, she really kind of told my uncle what to do, kind of bossed them around. They were well to do. Um, and he was a very timid person, a very kind person, but also very timid. And I just thought, you know, I mean, my mom and I used to watch it. And that, that that's the first thing we said when we first started watching it was this was uh, very much uh, just like them. And, and it holds a place in, in our hearts. I, do you have something similar like that? Yeah, I do. Um, back in the 80s, when I first discovered Doctor Who, I, I always had a passion for pretty much anything British. I don't know why it's just, you know, that kind of is something that brings us all together as far as, you know, fandom and stuff. But uh, I started watching British comedies like Are You Being Served and Keeping Up Appearances and One Foot in the Grave. And uh, Iowa Public Television at that point in time, I was living in Iowa and every Saturday night, Iowa Public Television had Britcoms for four hours. And uh, I, I watched them when I was growing up all through junior high and high school. But then after I graduated college, I moved back home with my mom and I had discovered that my mom enjoyed sitting down on Saturday nights and watching Britcoms. And so for uh, the while that I was living at home for a, a couple of years, every Saturday night, it was my it was kind of a special time for me and my mom to get together to sit down and enjoy British comedies and uh, just, you know, laugh out loud at, at the hilarity that ensued and uh, keeping up appearances is one of my mom's favorites and mm. uh it you know it's just the to me the the just the writing of the show although it was kind of formulaic it still had a, a special charm to it and it was just hysterical the situations that would that would happen from week to week or from episode to episode Absolutely. Now, for those of you who don't know, and they're just kind of coming into the panel, uh, Keeping Up Appearances was a series that ran from on the BBC, BBC One from 1990 to 1995. And it was uh, written by Roy Clark. And uh, Roy Clark is known for writing a number of massive hits in the UK, amongst them The Last of the Summer Wine, as well as Open All Hours. And so there's a lot of cachet to what he's written. Um, and uh, it, the, the series is just basically about a woman by the name of Hyacinth Bouquet, uh, even though it's spelled bucket. <laughs> and that's just one of the many things that I think is really funny about the program is that this woman keeps trying to up her and, and Richard's uh, status in society. And she keeps trying to get herself ingratiated with with the more elite of, of the culture of, of her community. But the, the funny thing is, is basically everybody associated with her family and everything else 
they're 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 common. They're even they're even maybe a little bit less than common. They are people who you know they 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 don't have a lot of money. They're they they're scandalous in a lot of ways. Uh, her own father um, has uh, is not quite right in in certain areas, and he ends up doing stuff that is very embarrassing for the family. So each episode literally is her reacting basically where she's she thinks that she has this thing going on that's going to help her and Richard get you know more ingratiated in society but every single time her her, her brother-in-law <laughs> Onslow shows up with her with her daughter day or with her sister Daisy and uh it's just and, and uh and and her other sister Rose and like like you said hilarity ensues and I know this isn't a great uh, description of the program, but you really do have to watch it to to kind of believe it because it just gets more outrageous every episode. Yeah, it does, and uh, the it's always interesting to see how uh, you know Hyacinth even starting with her name. You know, from that point forward, anything that she can do to to raise her social status from where she uh, came from to where she is now to where she wants to be. Uh, there the all the different ways and different plots and schemes that she has to try to get her up to that that one step further to get herself noticed by the elite crowd uh that's what each episode's all about it really is and and to your point earlier you had mentioned that you know there it's 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 formulaic um you know it's like every every time uh she her and and richard goes to onslow and daisy's house the same thing happens every single time mm -hmm. you know they're going up to the door in, in this kind of rundown area and there there's a there's a like a, a dead car in the driveway and every time she goes near it a dog comes out and barks at her uh. and she falls into the fence every single time or her neighbors next door uh comes over for tea and uh she she you know uh, her her neighbor is so worried about spilling because this is you know the way that Hyacinth uh, uh, pronounces the name of the China. It's the same thing every single time. It's literally like the same episode almost every single yeah. time, but just in different locations. Yeah, and it's it's one where when you after you watch a few episodes, you almost have like a checklist that you work your way down and every, you know, you know, the, the neighbor comes over and, and Elizabeth almost drops the China check. Got that <laughs> off the list. Um, she runs into Elizabeth's uh, um, brother. Who's the, the uh, music teacher. Music. Yep. And so she has to sing off key at him. Check. Got that one off there. <laughs> you know, there's, there's always these, this list that you have to work down, but it's, it's funny no matter what, it's one of those that just, Every episode, you you know what's coming, but at the same time, you're going to laugh at it no matter what. And Jeremy, I was going to ask you, because you, as you say, that makes me think, why do we laugh at it every single time? Because I do it too. I do it every single time. You know, that's a really good question. I don't know if I really have an answer to it, but it's there's just something about it. For me, it, it, it almost kind of the same thing with, like, are you being served? A lot of the Britcoms, I think, are kind of that way, that they do have a formula to them. And for me being, you know, uh, an American watching a British show, the, the Britishness of it, the is a lot of times is what makes me laugh. It's just, especially with, with keeping up appearances, you have this hyacinth who's trying to be prim and proper and, and uh, high class, high mucky muck. But then whatever happens to her, no, even though you know, it's going to happen and something's going to happen to kind of knock her back down a peg or two, you're still going to laugh about it because it's, it's fun to see her take these, these bumps from, from episode to episode. Yeah. And you know, the thing is too, I think that, you know, the casting of these, of these characters, I mean, everybody who's in it appears so lovable, quite frankly. I mean, you know, Onslow yeah. Jeff played by Jeffrey Hughes, you know, Onslow is just this big lug and you just, you can't help, but just, just like him. I mean, they when they show up and ruin Hyacinth's stuff, and it's not because they're trying to, it's just because they want to be a part of it. And mm -hmm. they're just like, you know, they, they think that they're just, you know, showing up to help out or whatever else. They don't see themselves the way that Hyacinth sees them. And it's uh it's really interesting, but it, they're just they're 
all of them are really just lovable. Um, they play the characters very lovable, which is interesting because, you know, not, you know, I hate to say it, but I mean, from what I've seen and heard, like, for example, Clive Swift, who plays Richard, mm -hmm. is not a lovable person, who was not yeah. a lovable person. So, you know, I mean, the power of acting, I guess, but they, it's so good. It's just so good how they portray those characters. It is. Uh, you know, you're talking about Onslow, and Onslow to me is somebody that I always enjoyed because he was the big lovable oaf who, you know, he didn't have a care in the world. He didn't care what you thought of him. Uh, he was lower class, but he was proud. Uh, he was almost proud to be it and show that he was. Mm -hmm. um, and and Clive Swift, uh, he he made you know made him such a uh, somebody you felt sorry for because he had to put up with Hyacinth day after day, episode after episode, and trying to tread lightly on eggshells around her. And at the same time, be as helpful as he can without taking it up to her level to yeah. to uh, to to come up with, or help her on her scheme to to try to get that one step up. I've always wondered because I don't think it's ever been clearly stated what Richard does, what Richard did for a living. I mean, he did. It, it, it seemed like it was like office, like middle management, probably not upper middle management, though. It seemed like he wore a suit. And tie every day to work, but I, you know, it just you know, I all I remember is him being in, and like that they would see him once in a while going to an office or something, but there wasn't really yeah. anything more beyond that. And then, um, didn't he by about the third season, by about halfway through the series, didn't he retire at that point? He, yeah, because there's that episode where he retired, where it was his last day of work, and he was really upset because that meant that he'd have to be <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> full time. Uh -huh. <laughs> And then, and then uh, they had where as I think it was around that time that she decided that they needed to have some kind of country home, right? Yeah. Uh, that uh, that they went looking for that, and poor Richard, he just he couldn't say no to her. He couldn't say uh, he never could say no to her at all. I mean, it just it wasn't in his nature. He's so timid. Um, the only time you'd see him um, uh, have any sort of like you know just not so sure about stuff is when uh, their son would. Uh, call and like always want money or something. Yeah, yeah, that would be about the only time you would see Richard kind of put his foot down or or at least say you know tell him no. But Hyacinth, I think her her personality was so big and loud and boisterous that I don't think Richard, even if he was a little bit not quite so timid and more just kind of strong, I don't think he would stand a chance against Hyacinth in in anything. No, but there was, I don't know if you remember, there was one episode where she's, she's like really kind of going a bit overboard and they're over by, um, and she's like trying to make a phone call at a phone booth or something. And he finally just loses it. And he's like, you get back in the car and sit down. And she just stares at him and then she does it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, wow, look at that. You can uh -huh. do it. You totally can do it. My goodness. And, uh, that that was always um, that was always a fun part about. It. But I mean, if you you can't do that too often, can, can you? Because uh, that he, he, the point of it is that he doesn't have a backbone. Yeah, exactly. That's that's part of the charm of the show is that he he is the meek, timid husband that is you know he he wants to stand up to to his wife, but at the same time he doesn't have the backbone to do it. And he loves her enough that he's willing to go along and try to help out with whatever scheme she has for the week. Yeah. Yeah. And, or roll his eyes or just, you know, whatever yeah. else. And I, you know, it, it's, and I'm trying to find, I, I can't, I'm, I'm really uh, blanking on the name of their son. Uh, I'm trying to remember, and I'm, I'm actually um, looking right now to see if I can find it. We never see him. We only hear him the phone ring, and that's yeah. him. Uh, I can't but, remember the top of my head either, but I, I just remember whatever he would call up, she he would always call and ask him for money, and they would it always would be a, a joke or two or a one liner or something, alluding to the fact that he was gay. Although yep. Hyacinth never wanted to admit that, or wouldn't never catch on to that. And and because I was going to say, I think that's because that's kind of the point I was getting to is is that that might be an area that maybe hasn't aged all that well. 
yeah in the series because it, it definitely was one of those things where it was you know they you know, it's it's a really interesting thing on that whether or not it's you know what people think about whether that aged well or not because mm -hmm. i mean it's just one of those it was you know I, you know jeremy in the 90s we were much younger so I mean, we we were we were all about like that was that was progressive times, and it was progressive mm -hmm. in a lot of areas. And and yeah. now we've it, it, things have 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 become much more clear and whatever else. So you know it's but people like Roy Clark who wrote a lot of you know wrote these things, and I think you'll find a lot of that in like Last of Summer Wine, certainly in Open All Hours. You know those are things that you know that that are just those type of pieces of humor. They just exist, and you know it's it's. I'm I'm certainly never been one to hide that stuff, you know, like say it shouldn't exist or anything. It's, I think what I look at it is to be able, for myself at least, I think, well, I'm happy that I'm able to identify that that is probably not great anymore, but it's, you know, but it's there, don't hide it yeah. because there's no point in that. There's no point in censoring anything like that, I don't think. No, I totally agree with you, uh, you know, 100%. You know, bad, the part of, civilization and part of humanity is learning from past mistakes or yeah. the way we acted in the past and changing the our what we do into the future and you know there's lots of tv shows where you can see that where something that was made 25 years ago yes there's going to be things in it that might not be socially acceptable nowadays but back when it was made there, we weren't as aware or enlightened as we are now. And so there's no, you know, I don't think we can fault ourselves for what we didn't know was going to yeah. happen in the future. But we can fault ourselves if we don't want to move on. Yeah. And we don't exactly. want to. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Now, uh, just looking at, I was going to, I was a couple different places. I was going to go with this. Uh, one of them is, that uh we had we had a couple of uh of cast changes really the only one that we've had in it was i think what after the first series that rose changed uh became a different was played by originally played by a one woman named shirley Stelfox, and then mary miller uh took over after that and uh i, I don't know why they left but i mean to me rose obviously is definitive with the second person yeah. who played Shirley. Um, and we also just, I think it was just last year that we lost uh, Josephine Tucson, who played Elizabeth. I mean, we don't, we only have now from the, from the full original cast, I think we only have Judy Cornwell, who's Daisy and Emmett Hawksworth, uh, Emmett uh, played by David Griffin. Wow. I know. That's, that's surprising, although when you think about it, oh, it was... Oh, gosh, we also have Hyacinth. My God, we it? also have Hyacinth. Hey, you, have me, you have me wondering there, because yeah. it's like, I don't remember hearing anything about Patricia Rutledge passing away. Fair enough. Wow. But, but you know, it, it, it was a show that was made, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, you know, like you said, you and I are getting older. The people that were making those shows were old, older when they were making yeah. them back then. That's that's another hallmark of a Roy Clark series is literally taking the elderly and putting them in impossible situations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's how many of those episodes that Hyathen's like, she's on a boat and she, you know, like she goes over the railing or something like that, or she's uh -huh. like being pulled by dogs or something like that. And that was something that Roy Clark, especially in last of the summer wine, which it was nothing but elderly in the cast that he would make sure that they're doing stuff like one of the famous, famous pieces of uh, Last of Summer Wine, which if you say this to people in the UK, they probably, who know, probably roll their eyes because they're so sick of hearing about it, would be um, uh, Sam Comes Home. And uh, that's the name of the episode. And it's all about uh, one of the characters going down the street in a bathtub. And that is hugely famous in the UK, a very iconic moment. But it's that sort of thing that Roy Clark would always do in these programs that like he would put people who you wouldn't expect to do certain things and he would put them in those situations. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, watching keeping appearances with my mom, I think that's part of what her enjoyment was about it was that 
Uh, she was roughly the same age group as as uh, Hyacinth and Richard uh, at that point, probably a little bit older. But I think she enjoyed seeing the people of her own age group having these kind of adventures and having these these oddball things happen to them. And that kind of brought the enjoyment and the humor to, uh, more something that she could relate to. Yeah, no, I, I get that. And the thing, too. As we're talking about, and this is what I was going to get to, and I totally forgot about like the the kind of the maybe now we look at missteps and stuff. You know, at the end of the day, keeping up appearances is not highbrow humor, right? I mean, that right. was that's always really what it kind of comes down to. That this isn't something that you know, it's not a in my and this is me putting on. You may disagree completely. Like it's not a black adder. It's not, you know, a faulty towers. Uh, you know, it's written by somebody who wants to make people laugh, but it's not going to be, you know, anything sophisticated. It's meant to get people to have belly laughs. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the charm of it. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, there's something to be said about, yes, there's plenty of TV shows and stuff, even comedies that are, like you said, black adder, for example, something that is one where you have to think about it or is more of a cerebral comedy. But mm -hmm. there's something to be said for those comedies that are just ones you can kind of sit down, turn your brain off and just enjoy what, what is put in front of you. And I think that kind of goes in with the formulaic episode of, you know, from episode to episode of Keeping Up Appearances. It's like, yes, you understand what's going to happen. You kind of have an idea what's going to happen. Sure, the situation might change a little bit, but you can still turn off your mind and just enjoy enjoy what's put in front of you and and have that belly laugh and have a you know 25 minutes where you can just have have something brighten up your day i think that's exactly what it is i totally agree with you 100 percent. and that's you know it, may i may i ask jeremy is your mom still with you no first issue she's not and my mom who i used to watch it with also is is not with with me either and nor are my aunt and uncle that I talked about, um, you know, those that in a way uh, and, you know, it, it's it's those moments that, you know, when I when I think about watching Keeping Up Appearances or as you had mentioned, also, are you being served? And we we had uh, up here in the cities, we had British comedy running five days a week or at least four days a week, Monday through Thursday on KTCA from 10 to 11. And when it was stuff that my uh -huh. mom liked whether it's are you being served or keeping up appearances and like you it was often back to back you know we would sit and watch it and I, there isn't a time that goes by if i pull out an episode to watch i don't think about about those nights in the in the early to mid 90s living at home still and mm -hmm. and having those moments i mean it's it's one of those great things that that really perpetuates my love for that show yeah i i am right there with you you know that's those those two shows, chemo appearances, and are you being served? Are the ones that, no matter what episode I sit down to watch, I'm gonna flash back to the the living room of my mom's house, um, that where we would sit. I'd be sitting on the couch, she'd be sitting in her comfy chair, and we would spend just an hour watching the shows and enjoying each other's company and enjoying the laughs that ensued. You know, with Hyacinth and Richard or the cast of Are You Being uh, Are You Being Served. Isn't that something? And, and truly amazing. I actually, um, I I ended up going out to Ohio. Uh, this isn't keeping up appearances related, but it's kind of related in a sense. Uh, out to Ohio uh, to visit uh, friend Robert, and uh, uh, this was in the late '90s. And someone that my mom worked with, she was, you know, she would talk to my my mom would talk to this person, saying, "Oh, talking about." stuff that we would watch and are you being served came up and this woman's like oh i love are you being served I absolutely love it and i um just uh you know i really love uh you know mr humphreys and i went out to ohio uh because john inman was actually out there for a pbs thing oh, yeah. and i got his autograph specifically for this woman as like a surprise my mom asked me to do that and brought it back and my mom's just like when this woman came in, she's like, What could I got for you? And she just she broke down <laughs> in tears. She broke down oh, yeah. in tears. She was wow. absolutely just she couldn't believe it. Uh -huh. I mean, that's the power of these programs um that are this just really touching. I just I think it's amazing. Yeah, I it, it is. It's it's interesting to see how something that is uh I would I would also almost classify them as quintessentially British. 
uh, mm. TV shows that, um, you know, in Iowa, Iowa Public Television, they were showing the, these two shows pretty much all year long on Saturday nights from seven to eight. And, the, you know, I at that point in time, I was in or just before I went to move to Des Moines and started helping doing fundraising for Iowa Public Television, I would show up and take pledges every year. And I remember taking pledges on Saturday nights during the Britcoms and how many people would call in and pledge money to keep the Britcoms on the air. And the people you would talk to, you could tell by their voices or, you know, they would tell you, I'm so many years old. I'm in my fifties. I'm in my sixties. Um, and they want, these were the shows that they enjoyed and related to in some way, shape or form, and that they wanted to see every single Saturday night without fail. Isn't that something? Uh, and you know, the thing about the shows that get exported over here, they are, I, I do agree. I think they're quintessentially British and at the very least they are, um, stereotypically British, you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. The the there's something about say for example keeping up appearances or Midsummer Murder or Doc Martin that there is something quirky about it very British about it the very mm -hmm. British style of humor or eccentricity something that is more mainstream over there such as back in the day like Zed Cars or Softly Softly or programs that just aren't really showcasing the UK as we expect to see it that those wouldn't do well over here they're just they, they, you need to have that thing that really reminds you that, it, you know, I don't necessarily know if it's true going the other way with American shows going over to the UK, but I certainly think it's true UK shows coming over to America. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there's just something about them that that there's a charm to them. Uh, there's a, a humor to them that just it, it, people can grasp onto it and can grab onto it and enjoy it. Now, one of the things that you may or may not know is uh, that the series, uh, Harold Snowd, who produced it, he, they wanted it to go longer than uh, it did. It went for five series. And even though I think a lot of us might be like, <laughs> how much <laughs> more of the same thing can we take? Uh -huh. um, you know, they, they clearly saw a couple things going on there, doing very well in the ratings on television in the UK. But it was also uh, one of the biggest exports from the BBC, you know, at that point, for example, Doctor Who, not anymore, you know, but yeah. something like Keeping Up Appearances, which was still new and still, you know, very funny. They wanted to keep that going. But Patricia Rutledge in the fifth series, she kept it very close to her to her uh, self, whether or not she wanted to continue onward. And uh, so she at the end she just kind of blindsided everybody and was like nope i'm done i don't want to do it and they can't go on without her yeah yeah she's definitely somebody you can't you can't lose that part of the cast and have the same show no but what i didn't know uh harold snow put in his his autobiography or at least his book talking about keeping appearances that uh they were all planning on coming back for a cut like for 97 96 97 doing specials and maybe another series in 99, but it never, ever happened. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, I can't no. actually. No, no. And I, I, I guess as far as, you know, after five series of the show, I can kind of understand Patricia Rutledge wanting to move on and do something different or, you know, not want to be stereotyped as Hyacinth no. because it's, it's something that, you know, it might make it tough for her to get another job, to get another acting gig. If somebody is like, okay, I know you as Hyacinth Bouquet, that's the kind of, you know, person I, I'm going to cast you for and not put you in a murder mystery or something like that. Right. Um, so you, you can kind of understand where she came from. But I, I think, you know, you're talking about how popular it was back then, you know, as, as far as an export uh, over here to the United States. I think if she if they would have done you know maybe every other year or something like that maybe in and had her do some here and there I think it I think it was strong enough when it ended that it still could have continued on and I think the th the the real cool thing about British television um and it's only kind of started to pick up here a little bit is that shows could could end in the UK and then come back more than a year later you know I mean they'd yeah. come back 
you know, like Only Fools and Horses. I mean, that that ended in 96 and then it came back in 2001 and it was, you know, a pretty big deal. I mean, that was that was mm -hmm. a huge thing. Um, only now in the U.S. you're getting stuff that uh, had been gone for a long time and mainly because of the streaming services are coming back like a great example now well first of all night court coming yeah. back uh, yeah. uh that 70s show is coming back as that 90s show you know this this stuff is really you know it's 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 really uh pretty cool but you know i also understand why you know patricia wanted to leave i mean we don't want to have the world be robbed of hetty wainthrop investigates so you know we want to make sure that mm -hmm. she had plenty of time for that i've actually never seen a whole episode of that um i have not either I, it's not something that kind of grabbed at me saying <laughs> oh you need to watch this no no i mean i just i mean it's it that also though was very popular um and uh i i'm trying to see here real fast uh it, it ran from uh 96 through 98 and also 1990 is when i think it started uh but it was it was uh really uh, you know, it's, but that's also another like kind of uh, eccentricity sort of British television sort of thing. Um, also, uh, we were lucky in a sense uh, through PBS. And I don't know if, if this had touched you at all with your time working over, you know, helping raise money over for uh, IPTV. But uh, there was a couple of things that were made that were specific for PBS. Uh, especially for the pledge drive. So you yep. had Memoirs of Hyacinth Bouquet, which was in 1997. Yep. Uh, it was Jeffrey Hughes and Judy Cornwall in character as Daisy and as Onslow, and you're getting all these memories of what they went through. And then uh, when was the other one? Uh, Life Lessons from Onzo. That was in 2008. That was Jeffrey Hughes. It was the same sort of thing. And that was huge for, I think, uh, for public television, actually, to have a little bit of new content. Yeah, I, I think so. And uh, from what I remember, I think both of those were kind of clip shows, kind sure. of a, a best of thing. Right. But still having, uh, you know, the actors and actresses reprise their characters in something that was new, even if it was just kind of lead-ins and talking between clips. Uh, I remember uh, the, the first one that you mentioned, I remember on Iowa Public Television, that being huge as far as like a draw for for pledges because it was right after you had kind of finished up the series and it was still when it was a, a very big prominent show on Saturday nights for Iowa Public Television and having, it was something they were able to market as, you know, this is new. And in fact, I think that, that might have been one where Iowa Public Television actually helped pitch in for the production of it. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I know it for at some point, Iowa Public Television kind of helped pitch some money in to make something special for keeping up appearances. And I think it was for that special just because they they wanted to have the, the first dibs on airing it over and I the States. And I also think they did it for an Are You Being Served one for the funny woman, uh, uh, the... Uh... Uh, what's her face from uh, Mrs. Slocum, uh, Molly mm -hmm. Sugden. They did a documentary with Molly Sugden and they put money in for that too. I, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, I, like I said, Iowa Public Television, uh, the British comedies were a huge for Iowa Public Television. And so they were they were able to, to put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and kind of help fund a couple special things uh, that's for, for their viewers. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. And I mean, that was... You know, I, I just, I just remember, and it just, it doesn't feel this way anymore. I don't even know if like PBS, I don't know if KTCA, which is now TPT, if they're running like any British comedies at all. I think one time I checked in and they're actually running like Vicar of Dibley, uh, which was, I mean, I was impressed by that. But I mean, it's mm -hmm. just to me personally, Jeremy, it's not the same as it used to be. I used to really enjoy, and, and there's kind of almost a, Kind of for for me in particular, curse of it, it's all so easily easily accessible now. You know, it just used to be special. Like, oh my gosh, it's you know keeping up appearances again, or come back yeah. from snow or something. You know. Yeah. Um. You know, I I live up here in Minnesota now. I live just south of the Twin Cities, 
Uh, I haven't lived in Iowa for, for six years. And when I do go back uh, to visit family, I, I don't make a point of checking to see what's on Iowa Public Television on a Saturday night. Um, so I'm not sure if they run the British comedies still or, or not. Um, but I think you're right. I think in this day and age with so many streaming services and so many ways of accessibility to, to being able to watch what you want, um, you know, you can either stream something or you can buy it on iTunes or Amazon Prime and you, you, you have so such easy access to things. Um, for, for me, what I kind of relate this to is, uh, when I was living in Iowa, uh, being a huge Doctor Who fan, we had an Iowa Doctor Who fan group, the Universal Network of Iowa Time Lords. Mm -hmm. And when Doctor Who was not being made when it was in, during the wilderness years, we would have twice a year get togethers where people would drive across the state to get together and watch Doctor Who episodes because back then they were just starting to be released on DVD. They had come out on videotape, but it was nice getting a group of people together to watch these episodes. But, and we did this for the longest period of time, but then once Doctor Who started being made again in 2005 and it was fairly easy and accessible for people to watch, the, the, our get togethers dried up because people are like, I don't have to get together with people anymore to watch Doctor Who. I can watch it on my TV show or on my TV whenever I want. I can put in a DVD and watch it, or nowadays you can stream it. So, there's no real point to it, which is, to me, it's kind of a sad thing because it's not really uh, appointment viewing or getting together with people to to enjoy a camaraderie and watching a show together. No, um, it's it's kind of sad that that's that's kind of gone to the wayside now. It it is, and uh, I just, I it, I mean, it's it's great that I can go on a Brit box and I can watch Keeping Up Appearances, but now it's just like. And, and it's gotten to the point, too, like with some of the streaming services that I feel like that if, if it's on TV, if it's on like any sort of broadcast television, why do I want to watch it there when I know I can just, you know, watch it on yeah. you know something else? And it it's it's really, really unfortunate. It's not unfortunate, but it just is a change. And I, I do miss the old ways. You know, I do miss yep. people. And, you know, back in the day when when I was watching those with my mom. I'd also, because I, I, I'm huge into video recording, I love collecting the episodes. I love having them on the shelf whenever I wanted to. Those mm -hmm. were, like, I'd record it every night. So, you know, I'd be recording it to make sure that there's nothing was wrong with the episode, but I was also watching it with my mom. You know, it's just, yeah. those are very happy times for me, actually. Yeah, it was the same way. You know, there were plenty of TV shows back then. My, my VCR was always recording something or another, whether it be the, you know, a Doctor Who episode that I didn't have on videotape yet or a British comedy or, you know, play, the latest Star Trek Next Generation episode or mm -hmm. Deep Space Nine or something like that, just to be able to to have it, to watch it later because you were afraid that you weren't going to be able to see it again. And and oh, yeah. now we're, we're on the total opposite end of that spectrum. You know, if I want to watch an episode of Keeping Up Appearances, you know, pull up BritBox or buy the episode on iTunes for $1.99 and you're set. And the idea, too, I mean, it sounds silly to say, but I, I just think about it, too. It's like you can go from the beginning of the episode to the end within like a click. You know, it's it's, you know, back mm -hmm. when we were watching, it's all on like tape. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to run it. You know, uh, I was going to show real fast. I have because I collect this stuff. I have a couple of uh, releases of Cape Up appearances on DVD. And there's some interesting differences here. This is the one that was released in the U.S. Um, this was there. Uh, it's in like a little gardening pouch. Wow. Um, why? I don't know. She wasn't a gardener, was she? I don't remember her being a gardener. <laughs> Maybe it's because her and her sisters are all named after flowers. Well, and that's it because inside there are packets of seed. And, the, and this is true <laughs> seed. This is violet seed. This daisy seed. Uh, it, it truly, I mean, it. This this is turning out well. Okay, so yeah, Violet C. There we go. Uh, I don't know if this is still available. Um, when I was doing reviews for uh, BBC for their stuff, they would they sent this to me. Um, whoop, and I lost you. So we lost. I must have offended Jeremy. I lost him. We're gonna we're gonna keep this going here and see if he's comes back on. <laughs> here he comes. There we go. I thought <laughs> I figured I offended you talking about. No, <laughs> no I was interested. I, I like seeing this kind of stuff. Uh, so 
So this is this is the the release in uh, the U.S. and it it looks very nice. The problem with this release, though, being a, a, a video fanatic that I am, uh, all the episodes are filmized. Oh yeah, yeah. So they're not; they don't have the look of video to them, which is how it's supposed to look. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's a shame because this thing is packed with a ton of extras. It's actually really impressive. That's why I still hold on to it because I need to have a release that has all the extras on it. But then uh, in the UK, they have. A version. Um, this is the PAL DVD release in the UK, and it's across. I don't know how many discs this is, but what's gross about this is that each episode has they they imp superimposed a title over the episodes, and they they don't have on screen episode titles on broadcast. So, being a purist that I am, Jeremy, this is you know that's a problem as well. Yeah. And then also the, these are from, this is from those masters because these also, even though they're filmized, they also have on-screen titles as well. So you can uh, see the, the, the dilemma I'm in. Um, yeah, do you want to have it exactly as broadcast? I would, I would. And what's funny about it is uh, because a low low was released in the US before it was released in the UK, it was fully from the BBC masters and those don't have titles on it, but the ones in the UK originally did have titles on it because the same people did Keeping Up Appearances in the UK released a low low, if you could follow uh, all of that. So yep. that's that's how that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. You know, it's I I have yet to buy it on DVD. It's one of those that now you're being served out of the two since as I've gotten older and you know, what you once I cleared 50 years old, I started kind of reminiscing about, you know, my life and what I moments that I enjoyed. And when I think about my mom, one of the things I do think about is sitting there on Saturday nights watching those two shows. And, you know, at some point, yep, I'm going to buy them on DVD just so that whenever I want to wax nostalgic about, you know, the early 1990s, I could sit down and watch either one of those shows. So I it's it's on my list, my to get list. Well, and and that's the question too, right? Because, like you said, it's on BritBox. It's it's available. I mean, I mean, I am you. You know me. I'm I'm someone who collects this stuff, and I, yep. you know, there there's more. There there's not a lot of common sense over here at the moment. I collect, you know, as as much as possible. I just actually today, as of recording this, the Blu-ray to Wurzel Gummidge showed up at my door finally. So. Ah. Uh, and that's I'm looking forward to that. A friend of mine was in in charge of the restoration for that, so I want to see what that looks like. And cool. it was um, it was you know I just love having like how people love to have like records on a shelf or books on a shelf. You know mm -hmm. I love having these recordings on the shelf, even though sometimes like if I'm down here, I might be like, oh, I want to watch something, and it's like, oh, it's all the way upstairs. I bet I could stream it. And then I do stream yeah. it, and so I was like, "Okay, well, why do you have these recordings?" So yeah, well. no, I'm 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 kind of a little bit of both. I'm one of those who I'm old enough where I want to, if it's something I want to make sure I can watch whenever I want, and I don't want to lose it. I want to have a physical copy of it. You know, I want to have the DVD set sitting on my shelf. Um, however, I will be the first one to admit that if I have the urge to watch like Doctor Who, for example, I have found myself lately turning on with our Roku TV, going to the Doctor Who channel on Roku TV, mm. just to have an episode of Doctor Who to watch. Don't care what it is, just, you know, to get my Doctor Who fix. But I have all the, the Blu-ray releases of the classic stuff up to present, and I have all the new series sitting on the shelf so that if there's something in particular I want to watch, I do have it. And there, I've I've kind of scaled back over the years because I used to have a ton of DVDs. But then I started realizing, well, there's probably a lot of shows that if I want to watch it somewhere, it's going to be streaming one way or another. It might mm. switch from one stream service to another, but I still should be able to track it down. And, and I don't necessarily have to have it on my shelf. Now, do you have a favorite character? from keeping up appearances one that you just always like just kind of whenever they come on you just kind of smile or whatever um onslow always always makes me laugh no matter what um just like i said earlier you know he's kind of the every man i think he's somebody that that every every guy can relate to is he's 
lower class. He a, a bit of a slob, and uh, he nothing that you can say or do to him is going to phase him. You know, no. Uh, that's I I relate to him on that front, and Richard is somebody I relate to, um, especially after I got married because. Uh, between me and my wife, I would say she's more of a dominant personality. She is more like hyacinth, not so much seeking the the higher echelon of society, but she is somebody who's a lot more outspoken than I am. I'm more of the meek, timid husband in the background. You know, I still mm -hmm. assert myself from time to time more so than Richard, yeah. but I'm usually the one who kind of takes the back seat to things. I have a sponge that asserts itself more than Richard. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Onslow for me too. I mean, and and you know, you bring up a good point. I, I you know, there that PBS special, Life Lessons from Onslow. There's actually something to it because he doesn't care what people think, and that is a good life lesson, actually. To be, well, I I guess maybe Jeremy doesn't agree with that. Um, you know, but I do think that life lesson to be learned of being okay with yourself, being okay with who you are, and uh, uh, you you just want to get out of this, don't you? you just, <laughs> Whatever you I'm getting a bad signal here in my household. <laughs> well, and and I just I'm just kind of like I was just saying that you know it's you do learn from life life lessons from Anzul because it's like you are okay with yourself and that's something you should be. Yeah, yeah, it's that's part of his charm is the you know every single episode when you see him he's carefree he doesn't care what Hyacinth thinks of him he doesn't care what anybody thinks of him he's just this is who i am take it or leave it i wonder if that's the secret message of the series that you know that you you have all these different types of personality but the one that you think is the the slobbiest or the laziest is actually the one that's actually perhaps doing it right you know i th i think there there is definitely merit to that um i always kind of felt that Hyacinth spends episode after episode trying to to improve her social status and try to get up there. But on the opposite end, you do have Onslow and, and Daisy who are seem to be a lot happier than what Hyacinth is, even though they're on the lower echelon of society. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the secret message that uh, you you can get out of Keeping Up Appearances is that it doesn't matter where you rank or or what you're trying to achieve or strive for. Make sure that you realize where you're at and and be happy and and thankful for where you're at and what you have. Isn't it? That is really something. You know, I I, I don't know if you thought about that before, Jeremy. I never really have. And the idea too, when you're just not even thinking about like, look at Hyacinth and Richard, and neither of them are happy. And you look at her older sister Violet, who is richer and mm -hmm. more, but there seems to be a lot of problems, a lot of weird problems going on there. Yeah, as well. And and but like you said, you go down to Onslow and Daisy and and Rose, she's just, you know, that's that's something else. But Daisy, <laughs> Daisy is just one hundred percent in love with Onslow. She she yep. she just idolizes him. And that's part of the humor about it. You know, she talks about this you know, big, sexy man, and it's Onslow. Uh -huh. But that's that's the thing, though. That's that's actually what it, how it should be if you're with a partner. It should be like you, it doesn't matter what they look like. It's the person that you fell in love with. And I, there's like, is there something actually deep to keeping up appearances that I've never noticed before? I mean, <laughs> I, I, think, I think this alludes to what we were talking about earlier, about when you sit down to watch keeping up appearances, you you can switch off your brain and enjoy what you're seeing. You know, I don't think I've ever critically thought about keeping up appearances and what the message is behind it or what I should be taking out of the show other than a, a half hour worth of laughs every time I watch it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you. It, it was thank you for for making me think about, you know, what what message are, should you get out of that? And now I'm starting to think maybe I should as I watch other British comedies uh think about what message they were trying to purvey because i i i'm willing to bet that every head writer of a, a british comedy has something that they're trying to to get across outside of making their audience laugh yeah i think so i i do think so um is there anything 
any episode that stands out? I mean, they're kind of all the same. We've talked about that. But is there anything that stood out in, in your viewing that you're just like you kind of like you think of when you think of that show or that, that's a favorite for you? Unfortunately, not really. Like, you yeah. know, like you said, they they with it being such a formulaic show to me, the, the shows kind of blend together. Like, you know, there's not one specific situation that Hyacinth puts herself into or one scheme she comes up with to, to try to get her noticed by the, the upper society class. Um, there's, there's just moments here and there um, that kind of pop into my head and putting it, which episode goes to what moment is to me is now nah, there's no point in doing that. I just remember all these little things happening and, and uh, lots of scenes with Daisy and Onslow showing up at the most inopportune time to, to kind of thwart Hyacinth's plans. Yeah. The one that I've always enjoyed uh, and it's because it is different. It is, it is a little bit different. Um, it's one of the Christmas specials and that's when they go on the cruise and uh-huh. Uh, it's just at the end of the episode, because somehow, some way, Onslow and Daisy and Rose, they're all on the cruise too. And uh-huh. even though they couldn't afford it, so they must have, I think they won some contest or something like that. And I think the whole episode, if I'm not mistaken, Hyacinth thinks that Onslow has, uh, has uh, smuggled himself and Daisy on board. And uh-huh. so when she sees him, he's, she's just trying to like hide him from people and stuff. Uh-huh. But at the end of the episode, um, like I said, as a Christmas one, at the end of the episode, they're, a, they're, a, it's, they're in a, one of the ballrooms and it's all dancing and stuff. And, and uh, Onslow, after whatever, you know, cavalcade is, of comedy has happened, uh-huh. he just looks at her and he goes, do you want to dance? And she's like, yes, I do. And it's like a, a nice ending for the episode where, you know, it's just like, you know, they're just, they get along, you know, they yep. got along. And I, I uh-huh. thought that was, that, I always like that. It's always been kind of fun to, uh, when, when they're always kind of, everyone's kind of, you know, butting heads a little bit to have those moments where it is family and they yeah. are getting along, you know, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I liked about the show uh, is the, the name of, of Hyacinth and her sisters, you yes. know, the, the, how, Daisy is the kind of the the lower class uh, person, and she or the the name kind of reflects that. Daisy's like not that popular of a flower; is not anything fancy. Then you have Rose, symbolizes love, and you have Rose being all promiscuous and and seeking mm-hmm. that love. And then you have Violet, who uh, is the is higher than hyacinth, um, and the violet is kind of a, a more a little bit more precious flower than a daisy so that puts her up above and hyacinth i always took to be the flower that wanted to be uh big and bold and beautiful and way up there but just isn't quite can't quite make it there there you are i think that it's i think that's dead on i mean that yeah. Isn't that true? I mean, luckily no one was called dandelion or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, did you, I, I, I didn't see this uh, a few years back when the BBC was celebrating like uh, 60 years of comedy or whatever it was, they were mm-hmm. kind of revitalizing some of the, the shows they did like a uh, new open all hours, new uh, good night, sweetheart. They remounted like Hancock's half hour with Kevin mcnally and stuff like that but they did young hyacinth have you heard of that i've heard of it but i i didn't see it and i didn't really i remember hearing about it when it was when it came out and when they aired it but it just to me wasn't it didn't sound like it was the same as what i was used to watching so i didn't really have an interest in in checking it out i i was exactly the same and maybe maybe we're not giving it a fair chance but at the same time it didn't look it didn't look tonally uh the same as the series and that's what i liked about the series was the comedy aspect i think this was touching more on light comedy drama and uh this it just it just didn't interest me either not to say it's not good i haven't seen it but it just sometimes it's just one of those things that you're just not really going to care to see some of that stuff yeah and uh kind of along those lines one of the one of the things i like about the fact that uh Patricia Rutledge wanted to quit doing the show after five seasons is um, 
usually it, it's more for like a drama than it's for a comedy, but I, at least they went out on a high note, in my opinion. Yeah. They, you know, they, they didn't run the show into the ground and, you know, as much as we talk about how episodes for the most part are formulaic and it's the same kind of situation over and over again, it, it never reached the point where I felt like, Oh, this, here we go again with the same thing. It's like every episode had enough of a, a change or a nuance to it that made it enjoyable. Even if it followed the same formula and had that same checklist that you could check off, you know, tick off the boxes as the show went on. I mean, obviously it kept getting renewed, you know, it kept getting renewed. People loved it. People really, really wanted it. Even though something like last of the summer, line, the summer wine lasted for 31 seasons, 32 seasons, something like that. Mm -hmm. I really do think that it was kept. Uh, it was, it was, it was fine in the ratings, but I think it was also kept because it almost felt like that. I think the BBC were almost afraid to do anything with it because it had been such a stalwart for so many decades. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's nice when a, a show is able to go out on a, a high note or, you know, like I said, not being run to the ground where you can stop when while you're you're doing well. And uh, even if the higher ups might say, oh, we want to want you to do more. Um, and I'm sure like I'm sure Patricia Artledge was uh, very much. I don't want to be typecast as high as I want to go on and continue my acting career and. <laughs> I get it. No, I get it. Uh, and hopefully he'll come back on in a second. One thing, though, too, that uh, there we go. We got him back. I cannot catch a break on this. Uh... At least you come back quickly. You, <laughs> oh, you rebound yeah. remarkably well. Actually. So. Uh, one of the things I was going to quickly say, because we only have a couple minutes left, too, is like, I hope they don't ever decide to make something like this again, because I think the thing that was really strong about keeping up appearances in a lot of British television from the time period is that some of these characters some were just not redeemable at all. Uh, some that were just very selfish and that they, they like Hyacinth never really saw the light, so to speak. She never was like, there was never a special episode that she picked. She got it. You know, she yeah. got what she was doing and I don't think you need to. And I think now I think, I think shows like if, any type of these shows probably end up trying to humanize these characters a little bit more. And I wouldn't really want that to be honest. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I think, uh, Hyacinth was was somebody who, as much as you might not like what she's trying to do or be against, you know, her. Yeah, my goodness, You're, he's right. He's not catching a break tonight either. Um, we we're we're coming to the end here, and uh... apparently my kids are using all my uh, <laughs> my wireless. Um, but as as much as she she's trying to. Uh, make her better herself or show or appear better than what she is. Um, you still have that kind of soft spot in your heart for her. And you know, she's not going to learn her lesson or realize what she has. And you're right. I think nowadays, if we tried, if they tried to do that kind of show at some point, you're going to have to have her learn her lesson or come to a realization. And uh, that was part of the charm with, with the, uh, the show is that it was, she doesn't learn her lesson. That's what makes it funny. Yeah. Is that she keeps trying to do this over and over again, trying to, to get to her final result, which never happens. Now, uh, Jeremy can be found on Twitter at, uh, Dr. Who P P two P panel to panel. And, uh, also you can go to his website, Dr. Who comics.com. And you do a podcast, right? Yep. I do a podcast. I just cleared 150 episodes. Uh, it comes out every other week. And uh, if you're interested in Doctor Who comics, you want to hear really good interviews with uh, comic creators of Doctor Who, whether it be editors of Doctor Who magazine, uh, artists, uh, writers. Uh, I got tons of interviews and are always looking to chat with new people. And for myself, if you go over to YouTube, I do a video series called Doctor Who on BBC Video that talks about the VHS range, as well as I do reviews and comparison videos as well. We're calling this a panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeremy, for, for, for doing this with me today. Oh, no problem, Greg. Thank you for having me. And uh, that's, that's it. Once again, uh, enjoy your time at Council Room 10 Years in the TARDIS. Thank you, everybody.